for Ernestine today. Um, today, I'm going to talk about a story of Ernestine, the enterprise architect, who starts her new assignment from starting her assignment until she has established a sound enterprise architecture practice. Uh, my name is Wolfgang Goebel, and I'm the president of the Intersection Group, and all of my motivation comes from some years of doing enterprise architecture, which was quite frustrating quite often because we quite all too often lack a certain impact. Uh, and with our work in Intersection Group, we want to change that. We want to help people create better enterprises. So that's what we are all about as Intersection Group. That's our mission statement. So we are a not-for-profit association creating our first product. It will be released in, in March. I will talk about this after the show. Um, yeah, and we are a not-for-profit association and trying to build a community. And for that reason, we also give webinars. We are really keen to bring some of our wisdom of our community to the people. Um, and to your questions, yes, um, there will be a recording. Everybody gets the recording and the slides uh, after the show. And I think there will be a 10 minutes or so Q&A. So if you, whenever you have a question, type it to the chat. Usually I answer the questions after the show. And you all get the slides and the video. So let's start. Today, it's all about this lady here, where it all began. And she started March 1st on her new assignment at Intersection Railways. And she was hired as a senior enterprise architect with, with, with the usual job descriptions. So these role descriptions in the in the job advertisement, right? And it's they asked her to have 10 years plus of soft experience in software engineering, five years plus as an IT architect, a strong technology background, and would be good to have a TOGAF certification. Uh, and this is quite a typical job advertisement. If you Google the web for, for enterprise architects jobs, they are still quite technical. So we must be aware um, that enterprise architects is still a bit in the IT space. And that's also where Ernestine started her new assignment. And she was a direct report to Chris, Chris, the CIO. And on her first working day, in she, he gave her a brief and the brief goes like that. Uh, please, Ernestine, I want you to manage our application portfolio, whatever that means, manage it. Uh, we need to document it in an enterprise architecture tool. So uh, we, we need to set up some enterprise architecture tool to manage our application portfolio in, in some kind of a repository. And Ernestine, we have a problem. The complexity in our IT landscape is totally out of control. I need somebody who helps us reduce this complexity. That's a typical brief for enterprise architects. And I want you to be there when we launch big software architecture projects, do some software architecture work, introduce new technologies, and create something like a target application architecture. And these are usual briefs. And that's exactly where Ernestine starts from, because he's the boss and, you know, he tells her what she shall do in the upcoming years, what her job is all about. But Ernestine is quite an experienced enterprise architect, and she starts with her personal enterprise vision. So what is it what she wants to bring to the company? And she has lots of experience, and she knows that enterprise architecture is not all about technology and IT and so on. So she has this bigger picture, seeing enterprise architects as a whole, as part of organizational design. Um, she has experience in that. Maybe Chris not that much, so he gave her a quite technical brief, but in her mind, in her heart, in her vision, a personal vision, she knows that she can only be successful when she builds coalition with the business. So it's much more about business structures. It's much more about designing, architecting capabilities, business processes, business structures. So it's maybe only 10% of technology and then 90% of business. That's, that's where her personal vision. And it's a bit conflicting with what Chris said, but of course she needs to obey at least to a certain degree. Um, but um, th these are steps she needs to do and she can also satisfy Chris demands, but in reality her personal goals are much bigger than only managing the IT portfolio. That's her personal enterprise vision. And so the lessons learned for her first day is chapter one. So that's the end of chapter one of this story today. 
enterprise architecture, be aware that enterprise architecture is still an IT discipline. It's broadly discussed on LinkedIn. People discuss what it is, what is what it ain't. But if you read the pre prevalent bodies of knowledge like Dogov and so on, uh, the prevalent architectural languages and so on, that the engineering, the gasoline smell is present ev everywhere. So be aware that it's still in reality an IT discipline and it's not well established in the organization. We must be honest enough that big companies have an enterprise, usually have an enterprise architect's team with 10, 15, I don't know, people. Um, but not many people know what they're actually doing. And uh, collaboration is often quite weak. So I believe there's still too many ivory tower enterprise architects around. Um, and that's really a big problem if you want to architect or help architect in designing the enterprise. And nobody listens to you because you're living in this ivory tower and we, the remainder of the show, we hopefully get some hints how to get out of this. Um, and yeah, and another advice is don't follow the goals of your boss blindly. I don't usually do it. I hope he's not watching. Um, follow the goals of the enterprise. Um, you serve the whole enterprise. In reality, you should be a direct report to the C-level suite, but that's not often the case. Okay, so you start from ID, but you should start uh, try to start up and, and communicate and build coalition with those people. Um, don't follow follow the brief of, of the CIO blindly. Chapter two: Explore existing wisdom. So that's a phase of maybe three, four, five months. Uh, usually, Ernestine knows she's new in the business. It's her first assignment in the railway industry. She's, she's new in intersection railways. And railway business is pretty complex. A lot is going on. And she has no clue about all the processes, all the capabilities, the assets are needed, the skills are needed, and so on. So it's always a good idea. And she's learned that from her previous assignments to start with exploring existing wisdom. And she used the internet, for example, and other sources, everything she could get to read, to understand what's going on in the business. And what she found is, well, on the web page, cool, there's a mission, vision, strategy, high level, glossy mission statement. So it seems as if intersection railways have a direction. That's good, of course, strategy is important for enterprise architecture. And then she has had a look at the products, also maybe on the web page or maybe in other documentations in the internet and she had a look at the organization handbook in the internet every company so far she's worked for um, had an org chart organizational charts she started scanning this so to understand hey, what's going on and and there were some process models and it application spreadsheets and she was not surprised that these documents were not consistent at all. So the business processes use different terminology from the org chart, uses different terminology from the, 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 the text on the web page, for example. Um, the products are maybe not so much aligned with the mission vision statement and, and so on. That's no surprise. Um, and maybe that's her task for the first month to understand the inconsistencies and where they come from and what's the reality, what's really going on in this company. So that's the start of her adventurous journey, of course. And she starts with looking at the organizational chart. Every company she's ever been at um, had an org chart and also in intersection railways has, has a manual that describes for each department, for each business unit, what are the outputs, what's going on, what are the main tasks for this department and so on. And so that makes a good impression, first impression, what's going on, of course. It's a good idea to start with the organizational chart, but you can't take it for granted. So the reality is much more complex and the dependencies between the organizations are very important. Finding the flows maybe is very important to understand what's going on in the enterprise and what can be improved. And looking at the org chart, she also starts with getting a better and better feeling about terminology. She, she starts with creating a glossary, intersection railways had already a glossary, but it was incomplete, it was inconsistent, and not all terms that were used in the process in the organization, all the material were explained there. So she started to set up a glossary on her own to understand the thousands of business terms. Many of them were new to her. So uh, she starts usually when the, with the architectural work to understand the terminology because clear terminology leads to clear and I prerequisite for clear architecture. You have these terms everywhere in the capability maps, in the process maps, wherever. So it's a good idea. And 
Amnesty always does it. It's a good idea to start with terminology, to try hard to understand a certain term and to detect inconsistencies and maybe redundant tasks in the enterprise. Quite often, that's her experience, um, departments call their tasks with different names. But if you dive deeper, what does it mean? Quite often you find redundancies just by consolidating terms, for example, that's part of her experience. And she does not only do a glossary, she starts to sketch the relations between the terms. Business object modeling, a big topic in the 90s, if you're old enough, huh? I've been there, I've done that. So you have a passenger and that's an object if you want. Yeah, So that's a person and somebody traveling with intersection railways. And then we have a passenger information terminal and a train, for example, and the station. And the train goes from station to station. And she adds all these links and relations between the terms because it's needed to understand what's going on and, and to understand the terminology of the business. She starts with just for her, just sketches for her understanding with such a business object model and relations between it. And then she met the people of the process department. Uh, so like intersection railways, they've had a um, group, a small group, 10 people, business process management team. And said, OK, show me your business processes. And then she had a look at the business processes and she found, oh, that's pretty complex. But how is it related to the organizational chart? And how is it consistent with what I've read, what I've read in, the, in the web page? Uh, and then she talks to the people and said, OK, is this reality? I mean, is this really how the work is done? Um, and people usually say, well, that's how we describe it. That's what we model. And we need to do it for compliance reasons. So the lessons lesson her. He, and, and she's not surprised again, because that's quite always the case, that the, the existing process models are not designed to explain what's really going on. Quite often, they are created for legal reasons, for legal compliance reasons. You must describe certain uh, processes to be compliant for the auditor and, 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 and so on. Um, um, and the people in the process management department are, were honest enough and say, yeah, we don't actually know. Sometimes the people we interview are not interested to work with us and so on. But we must do that because our boss and we have this norm or that norm, we need to be compliant. Um, yeah, and that's one of her finding again. Ah, that's a good starting point. So I have a better feeling about the flows in the organization, but it's not consistent with the org chart. So what, what's going on? The org chart says, it uses different terms than the process model. That's quite common. And that's the moment, maybe after one, two or three months, where she starts a first capability map. And she's a big fan of capability map. Yeah? So the idea is to create the enterprise on one page. You say, okay, that's intersection railways. Yeah? And I decompose it in customer facing capabilities into train operations, railway infrastructure, because she found out these are the major core divisions, business processes, if you want. So you have thousands of people building, maintaining the infrastructure of the railway, and you have other people who do, do the train scheduling on top of the infrastructure management. So that was pretty clear that these divisions make sense. Um, so she started a capability map with that completely incomplete, also just for her own use, consistent with the glossary and consistent with the business object model she's created. So, but that's only her perspective. That's only the summary of what she has learned from many, many interviews with the process people and the organizational people and so on. And then she went to her colleagues in the IT department and there were some people, they called themselves application managers. So they were accountable for development and operations for certain applications. So the lady here, for example, she was accountable for the train scheduling systems and the, and, 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 and the guy here was accountable uh, maybe for the train routing applications and so on. So that's the team of application owners in the IT department. And yes, they already had some informations about the applications. There, so there were some existing IT applications that described in spreadsheets in Excels maybe, um, and each of the teams uh, operating the applications had their own Excels, but they were not consistent again. And what she found is, oh yeah, that's valuable input. And we have quite okay descriptions of what's going on in the applications. And then she tried to match what's in these application descriptions 
with the capabilities she's found, with the organization, which the task, which is going on. And then she said, oh, that's incomplete. Maybe the descriptions are not complete. Maybe the people, people that have created these descriptions are maybe too far away from what's actually going on in the business. And then she found out, she talked to Teresa here, the lady, and asked her, uh, who has created the descriptions of the application? And said, oh, I've done that, I've done that. But, and then she asked her, do you really know the application well enough and do you really own the application who's the actual owner of this application and then there is said well actually it's jeff and jeff is part of this department in the, in the business unit not in the it space and that's also part of her experience um, that usually the wisdom and the ownership is and should be at the business side. So the IT side, of course, needs to operate and, and know what's going on and need to don't know how it's op op operational. Um, but be aware that and try hard that the descriptions in the application repository are created by the actual owner, by the business people, and that they must get accountable for their uh, applications. And for that reason, Ernestine set up a wiki a very common wiki, everybody uses it in the enterprise already for knowledge management, for any documentation of many kinds. And for that reason, she did not buy an enterprise architect tool from a, from a big vendor for, for a lot of money. She just said, oh, let's use the wiki because we want to democratize the, the input of the data. And we want to enable a process where the application owners themselves maintain the data because we need an application repository and we need to be needed to be updated um, and the only way to do it that's her experience is to bring do it in kind of a wiki and enable the business people to take their accountabilities and their responsibility to keep it updated otherwise uh, you will always run uh, you have an up, not not up to date repository of applications and she starts with a structure that she found in other projects. She said, okay, who's the business owner? So what, what attributes do we need in this application responsibility? She was tried hard to find this business owner and quite often she succeeded because the IT people knew it, not, not always, sometimes there were no name and then she needed to ask, okay, who's, who's the owner? And then she started with the description she found in the spreadsheet. Quite often she found it in the spreadsheet, but not always. And then she sent an email or went to a coffee and said, okay, Andreas Hofter, please help me with this description. That's your application. Help me describing it, please. It's your task and so on. And she started to democratize this, uh, the data, the, the collection of the data for this application. And the next and maybe last thing she did in this exploration phase, she had a look at the uh, multi-project office and they had this uh, big Gantt charts with the major big 10, 20, 30 big initiatives that were going on in intersectional railways. And they found some Gantt charts. And so she had a look at some changes, ah, what's going on? And then she had a look at the quarterly report of all the projects and the descriptions of the projects to understand which changes are going on, what's changing and how these changes are related to her capability map, so which capabilities are improved. And so, so she tried to connect the existing um, material coming from the business process, man the, the project management office, with what, what she already knew from the capability map. And she was quite, this was a tough exercise because not always easy to find it out from the description of the project. And she, so she said, okay, for now, different informations, I'm not able to connect it. Maybe in the next phase, in the next chapter of my story, I should talk to the, uh, to the multi-project management, to the project managers again, and maybe I need to talk to more people. And so the lessons learned in this chapter two, explore existing wisdom. Um, she knows that inconsistent terminology is often the reason for weak organizations, processes, IT structures at the end. Um, there's a lot of unclarity in organizations that are reflected in the business processes and reflected this Conway's law, if you know it, uh, in the IT architecture. So if you have a weak IT architecture, usually you have a weak organization with unclear accountability. And quite often one of the root causes is the terminology is unclear. So a lot of architectural work is 
improving the terminology and trying helping the, the company, the whole company, trying to get it sharper. Um, and what you also found as a lesson is, hey, there are various existing teams that architect in parallel. So I'm not the one and only person who is in charge of architecting the whole enterprise. I need to collaborate with those people. So she already met the process managers. And from a, one point of view, they are also part of the design of the architecture. She will meet the product people in the future. She will need to talk to software designers, to architects, and many, many people, to the experts, the product managers. Yeah? What are your visions in the business? Where, to, where do we go with your product? And so on. Uh, so she, one lesson is there are so many architects in the enterprise, which um, means that her role is more of a facilitator. It's more about bringing people together and getting their understanding, modeling it in certain maps, but let them do the work. Yeah? So that means a collaborative enterprise architecture process. And what you also find, and that's always, that was always the case in all of her previous jobs, that the dependencies between projects are not well understood. So there was this gun chart, yeah, and the project managers, time, time and, and budget, yeah, you know, do you need to deliver something? Something is not so important, uh, but time and, and money is very important. So the projects in the gun charts and the dependencies are really well understood. And that's one thing where she said, okay, maybe I can help those people in the multi project management office um, to understand them better. Because only if you understand the dependencies, uh, we can manage all the change going on in the direction of something like a target architecture. Um, and one of her findings from also from previous assignment, let the application owners maintain their application documentation, use a tool that they accept. So you, the tool should be available on many uh, screens, not only in the small enterprise department. Um, use a wiki, maybe. But after this phase, even after four months, and she really tried hard to understand what's going on in this fascinating railway business. She, ha she has some feeling now. She has a feeling what's going on, what it means to maintain, to plan uh, railway infrastructure, what it means to do some train scheduling, the cleaning, the energy business, the passenger management, whatever. She has a first capability map, but this was very incomplete and millions of open questions. And after this maybe three or four months, she came out to the open and she might use another three or four months to talk to people and try to show them her findings in the sketches, in the incomplete maps. And the first good idea is to find seasoned outliers. I like this term. So that means these are very experienced experts 30 years in the company um, and they know really what's going on and she tried to find them maybe five or ten uh, in all of the departments she, she has already built a, a good network to know where these people are um, and then she asked them well let's have a coffee I don't understand. So you are part of this organization. You are doing uh, maybe the train scheduling, for example. Um, I've had a look at the processes of train scheduling at, uh, at the organizational chart, and I already created a capability map. So that's my understanding what's going on in this big topic of train scheduling. And then she asks this guy some open questions and just listens. What's going on in your department? Uh, and where are the problems? Which IT applications are you actually using and what's going on? And she applied all of her personal skills. So that's the moment um, where she really needs her listening skills, the skill to answer powerful, uh, to ask powerful questions. So these are illustrations from our Enterprise Design Patterns book. These behavioral uh, patterns are part of it. Um, so that's the moment where you need your analytical skills not so much but you need to build trust to this person you need to ask the right questions to listen to listen to understand not only to provide a solution in the next instance so you talk to these guys and what she also knows is usually when you go to such people and ask them open question and you try to build trust and you listen and listen and listen people are not used to that people, other people listen to their expertise. Quite often their managers don't listen to the seasoned outliers. They know it better. I'm the manager in charge. And now Ernestine goes there and says, 
hey, tell me what you're doing. That's fascinating. I'm interested. Oh, cool. Yeah. And then what application are you using? Ah, where are the problems and so on? What are the dependencies maybe between train scheduling, your, your department and the other departments? Now she gets more and more information to get the capability more complete, maybe to draw a first sketch of a process or dependencies to other departments. But only for her understanding and she does so not only with one person of course maybe with two handful 10 5 10 15 people depending on the complexity of the organization and that means that her picture gets more and more complete and she draws this capability map makes it more and more complete still questions still not not consistent um, and what she also gets from these interviews once she was able to gain the trust of, of the seasoned outliers uh, is that they say, yeah, I would change it, but my boss here, the train scheduling, the, the, the head of train scheduling um, is in constant conflict with the train routing department. In theory, there should be an interface and the interface should be much better, but due to political reason, these two people always fight and battle with each other. Um, so that's the reason why we don't have this interface between the applications. And so, yes, we should have to pass some data between these capabilities, between our IT systems, but the other person, the department doesn't want it because that then he would lose some power and, and, and so on. And with drawing the capability map and the, doing the analytical part of the work, um, in the interviews, she also gets a lot of information about the personal conflicts between them, what's going on on the behavioral, on the political side. That's very important because she knows that are uh, design constraints. It's not always about rational thing. Finding a target architecture of IT means finding a target architecture for the organization in reality. It means politics, understanding that there are lots of human factors. And she knows that she must be careful with that, that they, these are design constraints, of course. And then she went to the top managers, to the project managers of the top 10 strategic projects. So she looked at uh, what she found in the multi-project management office and asked them for a coffee. Tell me about your project. And of course, these guys, ladies are really proud of what they're doing and they can talk about, yeah, that's a project. It's so important. It's strategic. And then she asked, okay, that's my understanding of capabilities. Which capabilities do you improve with this project? And that's my understanding of strategy, of mission, vision. I found it on the web page, right? So we have the vision to focus on night trains. Uh, so the, the C-suite is uh, pretty clear with our mission, vision, where we want to go. How is your project related to the capabilities? Which capabilities do we improve? And why do we improve those capabilities? How is it related to the business vision? And then she looked like, hmm, they don't know really. So this traceability was hard to be found. Um, even if these guys are proud and, and if all of these projects seem to be important, but no one of these 10 strategic man man project managers of the 10 strategic project uh, was able to answer the, the question, um, how is it related to strategy and how is the dependencies between this and that project? How is it related with the capability map and so on? So, and then you know, okay, there's a lot of work to align all of these people. And we have many people with special interests here of the project managers, right? Their interest is to be in time and in budget. And then I'm the hero. And then we have the product managers maybe, and they want to have better products. And then we have the process people. We need to document it. And then we have the IT people. We want to have cheap IT application landscape. And then we have a CEO that has a certain mission. And she found that all of these people, they have their special interests, but they are not that much aligned, right? Project managers going like, woof, architects, software architects, we need a new middleware layer and, 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 and so on. So she found a lot, she, she found a lot of misalignments. And then to find out the technical misalignment, she only also went to the software engineering department. She talked to the more technical guys, what's going on? And she found that they surprisingly sometimes have a lot of business knowledge because they are coded in business rules in the code. So it's a good idea to talk to them 
they are also part of projects. Yeah? So talk to them and listen to them. And then you also understand dependencies and then you can also understand flaws from a technology point of view. So it makes a whole lot of sense to create something like a software technology map. So that's in parallel. If you do enterprise architecture, you work with a lot of business oriented model capabilities, applications maybe, and so on. But there should also be a technology standard handbook. That's pretty common. So that's not new for you probably. Um, I think uh, enterprise architects excel in this domain, but are pretty struggling with the more business domains. But yes, that's also important to build a software technology map and heat map it, heat map it for example, and say, okay, we focus when it comes to application servers, servers, we focus on the G master app server. So that's not a real name. <laughs> and on the database level, we focus on this or that database. That's important technology standards. Um, but she decided to say, oh, maybe I can find somebody who takes care of this technology topic because I need all of my energy and time to work more closer with the business people. And I know somebody that there's this Henry and he's really motivated to deal with this technology standard. But the task is pretty separate from this more business oriented enterprise architecture task. And so what are her learnings from chapter three coming out into the open? Um, Corporate politics put constraints on enterprise architecture. It's not only analytical. And some, if it's political not possible, then it's a constraint. And you need to work with these constraints. Usually the best way is to get a mandate by the highest possible manager. So usually she starts at the, as a report to the CIO who reports to uh, to maybe the chief financial officer or maybe one or the, somebody else in the in the real C-suite. So the people really sitting on the board, CIOs are not quite often really sitting in the, in the board. Um, and that's one task also to talk to them. Yeah. And because usually they are maybe the only one person on top is interested in dealing with corporate politics and having transparency and making the change happen. So find a way to get in touch with him or her and build a coalition, for example. And then you have a, a coalition and you have an ally with somebody who can help you with the constraints you find, with the political constraints you find. Um, what she also has learned is build trust and coalition with as many people as you can get. Trust is your currency. If you lose trust, you can't work as an enterprise architect. Build trust with the seasoned outliers. Build trust with the software engineers. Build trust with the project managers. They are important, right? So they're managing change, even if often with a tremendous rate in the wrong direction, but they do the changes and be there and help them understanding the dependencies, for example, build trust with them and get information. So you need this trust and you need honest information in all of the tasks and, and get the information you need. And you need a lot of information that is conflicting and you need to somehow resolve this conflict until you find maybe a final capability map or a target architecture and so and so on. Indication flaws in the org chart. So she had a look at the org chart. There, she knows there are always flaws in the org chart. They're always political. There are always reasons why charts are like they are. Maybe they did a restructuring top down, right? So there's a lot of frustrations after restructurings. Means that the org chart is always weak. Weak from a certain point of view. Um, and yeah, and find a friend with software technology skills. Maybe outsource this technology topic. It's important, but somebody else might be a better fit for the more software technology aspects. Chapter four, design a safe negotiation space. So that was maybe after half a year, quarter, three quarter of a year. Um, and this usually takes one year minimum, probably longer designing a safe negotiation space. So we Ernestine already met plenty of people with conflicting interests. So enterprise architecture is not about somebody who does it, who is the big architect and can do it alone. It's much more about coalition building than you find interest. And that means to find a solution, you need to open a space to enable negotiations. It's not you that must make decisions all too often. Quite often, um, it's a negotiation between two, two departments, two heads of departments. 
Should maybe our department do this capability? Should we own this IT applications? Should we build the interface in this or that direction? There are always multiple scenarios. There might be the best scenario seen from this analytical mindset, but there's always the best scenario for the organization because there are people, there's interest. Yeah, Be aware that the interests in the companies are not always aligned. Yeah, And it goes like that. Yeah, And so um, to Ernestine, Uh, enterprise architecture is very much about opening negotiation spaces. And here she uses her tremendous social skills again. So she invites the people she's met previously, seasoned outliers and, and, and project managers, and find groups of maybe five, six, seven people and work on certain questions. And with this uh, make more coaching-like attitude, asking, well, I don't understand. We have this organization here, but I found out that these applications support these business processes, and that's not consistent. Can anybody help me with that? It took her at least half a year to have a deep understanding of what's going on in the business, to ask the right questions and to find the right people, invite those people in the room. And she already has the right maps ready. She has a pretty good version of a capability map, maybe. And she started to sketch some dependencies, first change of processes together with the process people, maybe, and so on. And then she opens a safe negotiation space. Yeah? You now have people with various interests that need to agree on and that need to be honest and say, I don't know. Oh, that's inconsistent. Hmm. The project manager, maybe it should, I should maybe change my project a little bit. There's a dependencies, maybe whatever. Yeah, Various interests. And that's really maybe the main task in enterprise architecture to find the right people, invite them to this uh, co-design space and let them do the negotiation. And you do the, Ernestine does the visualization. What's the best map? So she draws maybe her capability maps. Yeah, and then there's a lot of other maps in this room could be. So it's about this co-design and I like this. Uh, it's about the boat is intersection railways. So that's the metaphor for the enterprise, uh, for intersection railways in that case. And what you do in that case is you have a, maybe a white, maybe you have a sketch already, right? So you, should, you, you might have a, inconsistent, not incons incomplete capability map, and then everybody gets his or her pen and you want them, invite them in your diagram. The biggest moment is when your capability map or other enterprise architecture map is co-designed and people go to the flip chart or to the, to the whiteboard and start, no, that's not correct. That should be that name and so on. At the moment, I've had this Ernestine had this plenty of times in her career because she's quite seasoned. And that's the biggest moment yeah, when people start to co-design and find in the same map and accept the map and, and co-design it and own it in that way. Because the capability map and other maps of the enterprise are not owned by the enterprise architecture department. They are owned by the company. Yeah? The enterprise architecture department only facilitated. And she also started application heat map. So it's getting technical. So she needs an agreement of many stakeholders. Is this fit from a functional point of view? Is this technically fit? Uh, are we satisfied with the vendor? So the, we, we are back again in the application repositories. She also has this point of view of applications, but now related to capabilities. And that was maybe the hardest part in her journey. Not so much a description of an application that's pretty easy, but finding a reference to a capability map is tough because the capability map never exists. You only have an organization chart that is weak and inconsistent with the process map. So Ernestine, like always, is the first person in the enterprise um, that does this consistent. Uh, consistent thinking and tries to connect in that case the application SAP finance and says, hey, that's the capability finance that looks obvious, but in reality, that's really the hardest part. You need to have a strong frame of reference and then you can connect the applications to these capabilities. And she also, now she had some people in the room together with the process department. She said, okay, let's start with simple chains maybe for our core processes, right? So we do some strategic infrastructure planning, some uh, budgeting, we plan a track, we build a track, we maintain a track. So this is the process from we plan how we further develop our track, name, track network um, until um, we build it and then we maintain it. And, and how um, she uses that quite frequently, how are the IT applications 
uh, Stratup and Confluence and Planfrit, so these are all names of IT applications, how are they supporting various stages and various activities in the process, for example? And then you can do the heat mapping again, right? Red, get yellow, green, and then for, for, for maybe for some people for the very first time, you might fin find breaks where data is not passed probably to the next department, for example. It's an excellent way to visualize this change of processes, but it takes a lot of time. You must have a sound understanding of what's really going on. You must talk to the process guys, to the seasoned outliers to find these kind of processes. And you must have the group of people that agree on these processes. And she was the first person that managed um, that for the very first time, the, the seasoned experts said yes these are our processes because we have co-designed and yes we say that that's that's good work that's so much different that that's so different from what we get from the organism uh, from the process management department for example yeah and then she starts with those picture that is pretty common so if you are working in the enterprise architecture space already you are really familiar we enterprise architects do that all day long. Yeah, we have a capability map and we assign applications and we, then we do some heat mapping. That's nothing new, so nothing to teach you in, in that regard. Um, but maybe the message here is take your time to build a capability map and it's not your map. I've seen or Ernestine has seen that all too often that the capability map only lives in the ivory tower of the enterprise architects and it's not accepted outside the business. So that means it's not used for governance reasons because if the heads of the departments, the people men making the big decisions don't accept this capability map at yes, that's us, that's what's going on in the business, they don't like to use it for really strategic decisions. So it's a whole lot of work to get this map. And now she's able, finally, she's able to assign all the applications now stored in this wiki, for example, and related to capability maps. And there was at least one and a half year of work to get there. And at the next regular meeting with her boss, with Chris, uh, she said, hey, look what I found in business and IT. We need a mandate to work on these issues. Please help me set up clear accountability board structures because what she also found is, oh, there are capabilities without any owners. Nobody wants to own a certain cross-functional capabilities. And that's, that in reality led to many, many problems into weak processes and so on. So we don't have an owner for this core process, for example. We don't have an owner for a certain part in the capability. And I don't know, who said yes to this project because this project makes no sense any, anymore and, and the governance structures in the company might be weak. So please, Chris, help me because what I found so far are structures and I have a lot of hints of flaws, but to change them, we must be part of the governance of where decisions are being made. We must be present at the at the at, at the committees for example and we must be present with my our capability map for example at this board and so what he did and said hey that's excellent work so thanks ernestine for this excellent work let me talk to my boss to susan about this idea i think she will be pretty excited about your work because for the very first time we as intersection railway have a map that is based on reality of the real understanding of 30, 40 experts you've interviewed. So that's the first map of intersection railways where everybody says, yes, that's us. Uh, and for the very first time, we can find some initiatives and locate them on the capability map. And for the very first time, we can align it with strategy, maybe. I'm, I'm sure that Susan will love your idea. And then she gets her first date with Susan and Chris together, they went to Susan and she was pretty excited and say, well, that's an excellent tool for management. That's a strategic management instrument for the very first time. I have a map. I can prioritize. I now know what's going on much better and how it's aligned with our mission statement. And you're absolutely right. Maybe we should change our mission vision a bit. That's not aligned with the capabilities and so on. And it took, and that's quite common for her, at least one and a half or two years until she gets this date because she needs to convince Chris with, with, who gave her a completely technical brief and she 
did not obey completely. Yeah? So say, yeah, you will get it. But 90% of the work was not IT. It was business and understanding processes, organization, politics, and so on. And now she was ready to have uh, to, to build the trust and get the mandate she needs for her further job. So Susan said, yes, please set this up for me. And for the very first time, Intersection Railways had a committee uh, that did all the important strategic change decisions. So they combined the multi-project management office where they usually did, okay, shall we make this project, that project and so on and complemented it with the capability map. So each project needed to be aligned with the capability map and needed to be aligned with the strategy that was new for the company and that was new for all companies she's ever worked for. And for the very first time, the process managers and the enterprise architects and the necessary executives were in the board with a description, with a map um, that shows why we need those projects and what would happen if we don't do this project, which is more important. And, and she was able to establish her work as a management instrument, but it took at least two years to build the trust, bottom up, seasoned outliers, heads of departments, maybe project managers, many people talking, listening. That's what it is all about um, until you have the trust and you get there. So be aware it takes two years, even if you are the best enterprise architects on the planet, two years at least. So what are her findings? Invite all relevant people to the co-design. So you need 50 stakeholders, 70 stakeholders, and you draw a stakeholder map politics to understand who works against whom, who is aligned, who to invite to this co-design cool space. Hint, don't tell or lecture. That's a pattern from our book again. I love this very much. So it's not her who does the complete solution, the complete target architecture, but you need some hints, some directions, and then let the people in the room do the work, the co-design. Cool Get the help of the C-suite once you have good examples. So be prepared. You can't go there on your second day because then you don't have any substance. It takes a long time. But the moment is crucial that you are there and that you are part of this governance. And establish a clear decision process. Rules, how do we make decisions in these steering committees? Who has the right to vote? What are criteria? Why we do this change or that change, for example? And, and, and that, that, that things. And then the final chapter and the concluding short chapter. Uh, no, I, I want to, ah, the epilogue, right? So I want to skip this chapter due to time reasons. Um, the epilogue. So Ernestine was pretty happy with that she has established this process. And it took one year until the process got better and better and the principle, how do we make decisions, architecture principles you need um, to steer that, um, um, get, got more and more mature um, and got better and better and took another year maybe until this was an established process and everybody in the room know, knows how important this is. And then one day at night, she woke up sweating and said, oh my God, I forgot something. This was excellent work. No, it was really perfect work of Ernestine. But she understood that enterprises are not only architecture. She, she became aware that she never talked to the user experience designers. So that's severing the user experience designers. So there are people from the outside who design journeys and tasks maybe, and they try to understand the demands of the passengers to draw the customer journeys. And she, she sim simply forgot to talk to them. She, she just took the products for granted, for example, and she just took the identity, the mission statement for granted. So for now, she started, she started in the IT department technically and says, okay, these are the products and that's the organization and that's the identity, but you never talk to the user experience people. And this is the last slide of the day. And that's maybe the advertisement uh, for next week, because next week Milan will be telling the story from a different angle. And then uh, Severin, a service designer who starts his journey from experience. So she has a brief, make the experience for passengers better and so on. And then um, Ernestine and Severin 
they meet and they co-design products and so on. So maybe that's the final lesson for today. Uh, I think that most of you come from more from this enterprise architecture, IT-ish application portfolio management view angle like, like I do. That's the final lesson for today. Be aware that a lot of wisdom and change and important projects um, happen when you meet in this intersection. So if you talk to Severin and you meet and you co-design products, usually those service and product designers only see the outside world. They don't understand the architecture and what applications you need. And that's um, important work of intersection group of, of our community. Okay, so that was the story. I hope it was entertaining. Uh, I have only three more slides and please feel free to type your questions to the chat. I just want to talk a three slides about who we are. So what we're doing is we're running community and events and we are creating publications. And our first product will be out uh, March 29th. This will be called Edgy and that's the language, a language we need to connect those various disciplines. And that's very different from what you know maybe with more technically Archimed or Togaf and so on, enterprise architecture, more engineering-like languages. Um, we want to have this present as a language um, that is understandable and applicable and, and, and for business people, for user experience people and so on, right? So our language is Archimed and whatever are simply not there, they don't use it. And the goal for this edgy is to have a language ready to bring the people into the negotiation space and they have a language now and we know how to call it. So be there, there will be a launch event, of course. And that's this adv 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 advertisement for the book. I touched a couple of patterns today, uh, like this build trust or have a personal enterprise vision. Um, if you are interested, so that's the book. It's pretty and it's cool, of course. Uh, that's the marketing of today. And uh, you can go to enterprisedesignpatterns.com and you can learn more about our approach and over the next couple of years next year we are planning to publish Ernestine as a book so this webinar is a start um, and it will take at least until end of 24 until we publish Ernestine as a book we believe that can be a strong thing yeah that's the book again and we have webinars we do them weekly so next Wednesday what I uh, mentioned is uh, Milan and in reality Milan is, is the second president of the intersection group we have two equal presidents he comes from this direction. He studied design. And when we met, we first met, he was like alien to me. It took us three years and we worked together quite closer, closer and closer. Um, it's really fascinating what happens when you work interdisciplinary. If you, when you go out of your technical mindset, we are all engineers, right? We've studied IT usually and data structures and everything is a component and this mechanistic point of view. These guys think totally different, they're totally alien. And if you are open enough and up for it, I can highly recommend, of course, next week's webinar. And there are others as well. So we have maps, but whatever. So if you want to stay tuned, um, it's on our web page, on our events page. And we, I'm super excited to invite you all to the city who gave birth to me. We have a conference, Intersection 23. We have an annual conference, which will be done. It will be hosted in Vienna in September 18, 19. Um, a call for participation will be open in February, but the uh, ticket sales will start in April, uh, but just maybe save the date. That could be good. And that's me. Follow us on LinkedIn if you want to learn more. We blog a lot, so stay tuned. Um, ask us, send us a mail, whatever. And we have still some time for your questions. So that's, um, let's see if we have some questions. So I think there's one. Uh, Paul, oh, nice to meet you again. Ah, not lecturing, hint, don't tell and lecture. That's an important pattern. A bit of education that needs to happen with the group in order for everyone to speak the same language and have the same fundamental understanding. Did Ernestine establish this during the co-design kickoff? Of course, 
I've just not mentioned it, but that's exactly where we want to go with edgy. So that's the bigger vision. So edgy is for us the language people speak in this negotiation space, because today it's astounding how ignorant disciplines are with each other. And I'm the experienced guy. I use completely different terminology and some concepts are overlapping, but the disciplines don't recognize it. Um, yes. She, you, you must establish it and you must start with it. And at the end, it's a vision of intersection group. In some years from now, we want to have edgy as the prevalent language that is common in, in companies. Okay, let me have a look. Any more questions? Thanks, 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 thanks. Entertaining journey. Okay, that's not a question. No questions. Excellent sessions. Okay. Mm, no more questions. So then, thank you very much for your intention. I hope this was fun for you. It is always for me. So it's my favorite webinar. It's much better than just explaining capability maps, which I will do in one month or so. Stay tuned. Uh, and stay tuned. We will publish this end of 24, probably. Uh, Ernestine, maybe like a, in a comic style with a lot of illustrations. Um, yeah, and whenever you have questions, connect to us on LinkedIn or write us an email. Um, stay tuned and have fun because enterprise architecture and enterprise design is, for me, it's the most exciting job in the world and you can be happy to do it, right? Um, so see you soon at one of our next webinars and maybe we can close the session again with some dancing. I don't know, I can play this again because I really like this too. Uh, if you, but you can leave nothing else to say. <laughs> <laughs>